a member of the parish committee. We're glad that you're here online or in person in a beautiful sanctuary. A special welcome to those of you who haven't been here in a while or maybe you're new today. Our mission is to build community, search for meaning, deepen our spirituality, and make a better world. To learn more about First Parish or Unitarian Universalism, please visit uuwayland.org or contact Kate Holland, <laughs> Director of Lifespan Education and Engagement. Please feel free to reach out to a member of the Parish Committee or to Reverend Stephanie if you have ideas or questions about First Parish. A big thanks to all of our other service participants who names, whose names are in the order of service. Please note that Middlesex County currently has low COVID risk, yes, so masks are optional. Please mask or not as you prefer. Please join me now in taking a moment to say hello to one another, including a wave to the front camera to those online. Welcome again and let our service begin. Welcome. My name is Alyssa Lee. I'm the ministerial intern here at First Parish, and my pronouns are she or they. The Thanksgiving holiday is a time of great joy and connection for many. Yet for others who are distant from loved ones because of geography or some other reason, it can be a day of grief and sometimes isolation. And for many indigenous members of our communities, it can be a day of great mourning or anger. Today, we hold all of these differing emotions in love. And then you have the weekend after Thanksgiving. Our emails are getting stuffed with advertisers promising us, promising us a good deal. Stores are packed, as so many of our homes are as well. It can be challenging to feel like you can get any quiet or maybe just a moment to yourself. And for still others, they are grief-stricken by the silence in their homes and all around them. The long holiday weekend can feel endless. So whether you are here because you are looking for connection or because you just need some quiet and solitude, I hope you, are, you find what you're looking for here today. In just a moment, I'm going to invite the King family, which is my family, <laughs> to light our chalice and to lead us in the covenant. Today is also the first Sunday of Advent, so they'll be lighting that candle as well. As they light the chalice and the Advent candle, I would like to share with you the words from UU Minister Erica Hewitt. Do you want to come on up? who reminds us why we light the Advent ca candles, I wanna say calendar every time, candles as Unitarian Universalists. She says, thousands of years ago, people in the Northern Hemisphere were thought to have gathered wreaths of evergreen and lit fires as signs of hope in the coming spring and renewed light. The custom was kept alive by Christians and by the 16th century, the Advent wreath had gradually spread across many parts of the world. Today, Advent is the period of four Sundays leading up to Christmas. It's also the time when days are shortest, when cold settles in, and when people need the cheer brought by the promise of light and warmth. As we light one more candle each Sunday, this Sunday is the hope candle. This Advent wreath symbolizes our waiting experience, 
week by week, the candles remind us that the darkness of fear and hopelessness recedes as more and more light is shed into the world. The flame of each new candle reminds us that more is yet to come. George, can I lead the comment? <laughs> okay. With open, open minds and loving hearts, we gather to search for meaning, to care for one another, and to work together for a better world. And to welcome in this Advent season, we're going to play O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which is hymn number 225, so please rise and body your spirit. Good morning. Good morning. I am Kate Holland. I am the Director of Lifespan Education and Engagement here at First Parish, and my pronouns are she, her. You too can have a tag downstairs just like that with yours. So this morning I have a story to tell, and it is a fairy tale, so it begins once upon a time. And once upon a time, there was a lovely countryside, and in the countryside, there was a lovely castle, and in the lovely castle lived a lovely princess named Elizabeth, who was set to be married to an equally lovely young man who was a prince named Albert. Well, everything was wonderful. She had a beautiful castle, she had lovely dresses, she had a lovely prince to marry. But one day, out of nowhere, a big giant dragon came and burned the fields and stomped on the castle and plucked Albert right away and flew away. Everything was burnt and ruined. 
And the only thing poor Elizabeth could even find to wear was a crumpled up old paper bag. Well, she put it on and she straightened it up and she said, I will not stand for this. I will not. I will get Albert back. And so she followed the trail, which was really easy to find because the dragon just burned everything in its path. So she followed the easily followable trail and came to a big cave with a door on it. And she knocked and out peeps the dragon and looks at her and says, oh, a princess, they're one of my favorite things to eat. But I just had a huge meal. So why don't you just go along and I'll go back to sleep. And he closed the door in her face. Oh, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And the dragon comes back and he's like, I told you, I do not want to eat princess right now. And he's like, you know what? She looks at him and says, I've heard great things about you. I've heard that you are the biggest dragon anywhere. The dragon goes, well, that's true. I've heard that you can burn a fire that goes thousands of feet. And the dragon went, well, that's true. And she said, show me, because I don't really believe it. I think you're not really all bad. And so the dragon blew a huge plume of fire that went for miles and miles. And then, whew, he was kind of tired. She said, I bet you can't do it again. And so he blows another huge plume of fire. And it's to the point where it's like at the end, there's just little wispies of smoke coming out. And he's really tired. And he's like, see, I'm all that. And she's like, you know what? I heard that you can go around the world in 15 seconds flat. Dragon's like, I can do that. And so she says, show me. So the dragon wings around the world in 15 seconds flat. She's like, wow, that was great. And the dragon's like, oh, oh, that was awesome. And so she's like, I bet you can't do it again. And so the dragon's like, of course, of course I can. So the dragon goes 15 second flats around the world again. And he's so exhausted when he gets back. He falls on the ground and passes out. Whew. So the princess looks at the dragon and she goes, dragon, doesn't say anything. He lifts up his ear, dragon, doesn't do anything. Hey, dragon! Still, the dragon doesn't move. He's exhausted. And so she's like, well, now is my moment. So she opens the door to the cave, and she finds Albert in the cave. And Albert looks at her and goes, oh, Elizabeth, you're a mess. Your hair is all out of place. You're wearing a paper bag, and you smell like ashes. Don't come near me until you get yourself all sorted out again. Elizabeth looked at him and said, you know what? I've realized that you are a jerk. <laughs> and no one should have to marry you. So she took off and walked down the road. And she found a beautiful little cottage. And in the cottage, she settled in. And she didn't have really fancy clothes. And she didn't have a giant castle. And she didn't have all of those crazy things that one has when they have a giant castle. And she realized, you know what? My little cottage fits me just perfectly. And I love it very much. So this morning, we are going to work together in seat class to make some soup for everybody to have after service. I know, it's very exciting. So there are vegetables that need to be chopped and there are things that we're gonna to do together today. So I'm gonna ask my kids that are in seek, if you would please go down the steps or take the elevator that way. And then um, if you all could sing us out, that would be lovely too. Thank you.
Just beautiful. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Lynn Kavanaugh. My pronouns are she and her. And the reading this morning is a poem by Mary Oliver. Among other things, this poem is about an otter, O-T-T-E-R. And I thought I would say that before I began because in this big space, I thought it might be hard to articulate clearly enough. And I wanted to make sure you knew what the poem was about. Almost a Conversation by Mary Oliver. I have not really, well, not yet, talked with Otter about his life. He has so many teeth. He has trouble with vowels. Wherefore, our understanding is all about body expression. He swims like the sleekest fish. He dives and exhales and lifts a trail of bubbles. Little by little, he trusts my eyes and my curious body on the shore. Sometimes he comes close. I admire his whiskers and his dark fur, which I would rather die than wear. He has no words. Still, what he tells me about his life is clear. He does not own a computer. He imagines the river will last forever. He does not envy the dry house that I live in. He does not wonder who or what it is that I worship. He wonders morning after morning that the river is so cold and fresh and alive. And still, I don't jump in. Thank you, Lynn. Please join us for hymn number 55, Dark of Winter. I'm going to share a, a guided meditation of gratitude. It's adapted by gratitude written by our UA president, Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray. Let's take a deep breath. And out. I invite you as you're willing into this time of meditation and reflection and into this practice of gratitude. Please find a comfortable position for your body. I invite you to take a few relaxing breaths in and out. 
Another one in and out. Feel free to close your eyes if that is most comfortable or to leave them gently open. Breathe in a way that feels comfortable and relaxing. As you breathe, ask yourself in your heart, what or who are you grateful for? Is there anyone who is caring for you, showing you care, inspiring you, comforting you, anyone who you love, who you are grateful for? Hold that person or those people Visualize them. Hold them in the gratitude that you feel for them. Breathe in that feeling of gratitude. Breathe out that gratitude for those loved ones. I invite you to take a few more breaths. And as you do so, I invite you to think about anything about this day, anything that's happened, anything that you're looking forward to. Hold in your attention anything that you are grateful for from this day, that you're grateful to be looking forward to in this day, anything that's present to you right now. Just hold that gratitude and that attention in your heart and in your mind as you breathe in and out gently. Take a few more breaths and imagine opening your heart space wide and asking if there's anything else you're grateful for. Your friends, community, faith, connections that you appreciate and feel attentive to. Open your heart to other things in your life and this moment that you're feeling grateful for. Hold those in your attention. Breathe in that feeling of gratitude. Breathe in imagining or holding in your mind those people, those things, those connections. Breathe in that gratitude. It's also okay if some of our relationships are mixed with other emotions besides gratitude. Be present to that. Breathe it in. As you continue to breathe, take a moment to hold in your attention all these connections, all these relationships, all these gifts that you are grateful for. Bring them to your attention again together. Breathe in the gratitude you feel. Breathe out gratitude across those connections. As you are ready, as you continue to breathe gently, you can bring your attention back to this time, to your body, to each other gathered in meditation. And as we close, and as you breathe gently, offer a word in silence or out loud or spoken, a word of gratitude for these gifts. Blessed be. I'm Roger Horine, a lay minister of this congregation. My pronouns are he and his. This is a time in our service we set aside to share our joys and sorrows. 
In both our sharing and in the support given by our witness, we affirm our covenant to care for one another. To begin, I will light a candle of sorrow to acknowledge those who were killed in the shooting at Walmart in Virginia, as well as those who were killed and injured in two bombing attacks in Jerusalem on Wednesday. We also mourn the tremendous loss of life and hold in love the thousands of people who are without homes in Indonesia from an earthquake. I will also light a candle of joy for the beginning of the holiday season and the warmth and renewed connections many of us are able to enjoy during this time. If you wish to share a joy or sorrow, please add it to the chat now, or to share in person, please come forward to the front. As a reminder, you may also submit your joy or in sorrow in writing using the slips at each door. As a note, we are not live streaming this service, and joys and sorrows will not be posted in the service recording on YouTube. candle as a symbol of all the joys and sorrows that we hold in our hearts and minds. Okay. Now it's the time for our offering. Um, I just Want to say, so I don't know, many of you might know, but I'm, um, you know, uh, this is last year of my internship, and I'll be preparing to go in front of a, what they call the MFC, which is kind of an intimidating committee, um, <laughs> to decide whether I can be ordained or not, um, or come back another year and try again. Um, and so I just wanted to say that, you know, I don't know how much, if you all realize how much. Uh, work you all have done to help with interns throughout the life of this congregation um, and the support that you all provide to First Parish is really invaluable. There have been so many interns, as you all know, that have come through this congregation, myself included, and yes, I have an internship committee and I have Reverend Stephanie, but I also think of all of you as being teachers along the way. You all have been such good guides throughout this entire experience, so thank you so much for that. And, you know, as I said, your work, uh, your, sorry, the, the work of the parish is also to help further the work of the EU faith. So, um, and when you give to this, you're also furthering that. So thank you so much. Um, the next song is going to be, um, it's called Brave. It's written by Sarah Barry Alice, and Emily's going to lead it. And I just, I personally asked her to do this because um, I think it's, uh, it's a beautiful song and it really ties into the sermon today about being brave in whatever choices you want to make for your own life. Sorry, I forgot to say, uh, if you would like to give online, you can look in your order of service for ways to do so. Um, and then now the offering will be gratefully received. Thank you. You can be amazing, you can turn a phrase into a weapon or a drug. You can be the outcast to be the backlash of somebody's lack of love. Or you can start speaking up. Nothing's gonna hurt you the way that words do when they settle neath your skin. Kept on the inside and no sunlight, sometimes the shadow wins. But I wonder what would happen if you say what you want to say and let the words fall out. Honestly, I want to say everything with what you want to say and let the words fall out. Honestly, I Everybody's been there. Everybody's 
and stare down by the enemy, falling with a fear and dance and disappearing, bow down to my lady. Don't run, stop holding your tongue. Maybe there's a way out of the cage where you live. Maybe one of these days you can let the light in. Show me. First Parish Choir. That was lovely. In 2009, I was living in Washington, D.C., working towards my Master's of Law in International Comparative Law, while also fulfilling my dream of living in a big city. I was in D.C., the kind of place my little history and politics nerd heart could only dream of. And yet, I was miserable and lonelier than I had been in a long time. During that time, I found this cartoon online that changed the course of my life. Someone had taken an excerpt from a speech given by Calvin and Hobbes creator, Bill Watterson. The cartoon said, creating a life that reflects your values and satisfies your soul is a rare achievement. In a culture that relentlessly promotes avarice and excess as the good life, a person happy doing their own work is usually considered an eccentric, if not a subversive. Someone who takes an undemanding job because it affords them the time to pursue other interests and activities is considered a flake. A person who abandons a career in order to stay home and raise children is considered not to be living up to their potential, as if a job title and salary are the sole measure of human worth. He goes on to say, you'll be told in a hundred ways, some subtle and some not, to keep climbing and never be satisfied with where you are, who you are, and what you're doing. To invent your own life's meaning is not easy, but it's still allowed, and I think you'll be happier for the trouble. When I read this in 2009, I was dumbstruck. I was living a life that I thought would lead to success and happiness, and yet I was miserable and I couldn't understand why. Now, I didn't quit my program and change my life right away, but it did set me on a path of reflection and change that ultimately brought me to be here in front of you today. Perhaps you have had a similar moment of clarity a moment when some text or something someone says 
reaches out to you from the vast expanse of human experience, just shakes you and says, hey, you might pay attention to this. Your future is calling and it has news for you. What you're spending your time and energy on might not actually be the right fit. Or perhaps that voice has been a little smaller and is just quietly noodling around the edges of your subconscious, telling you the path you're on doesn't feel quite right. Or that your family and friends and maybe even just general society's expectations for you maybe aren't what you want after all. Now these choices don't always have to be as momentous as a career choice. Every day we make a million tiny decisions about how we want to spend the minutes and hours that make up our lives. Author Annie Dillard says, how we spend our days is of course how we spend our lives. What we do with this hour and that one is what we are doing. So the question is, how are we spending our days? Is it doing something that gives us meaning? And can we say that how we spend our days is a reflection of how we ultimately want to spend our lives? It can certainly be easy to get caught up in the administration of life, so much so that we forget that we are currently in the act of living life too. Many of us have goals for the life we want to live or how we wish we were spending our days, but we tend to hold back. We tell ourselves, Perhaps when I have time to breathe, or when things settle down in the house, or maybe when the kids leave home, or I get a different job, or when I retire. Basically, when all the conditions of my life are perfect, then I will make a change. Whatever our reasoning is, the admin of life, or dare I say it, the escapism that our modern life can bring, they frequently serve as the too welcome distraction from the life many of us intend to be living. I know I can't be the only one who maybe spends a little too much time on social media. Often our fears of not measuring up to society's expectations or of missing out can get in the way too. Many times I watch people at museums or the beach or some other community event who take pictures the whole time but who take little time to actually experience what is right in front of them. And I will be the first to confess that I'm not absolved of this tendency either. I often wonder afterward, how much did any of us actually experience this place or this time together? Did we really see the art in the museum or did we just take pictures of it? And yet so many of us are swayed to evaluate our own happiness or life choices based on what we see online or by the pictures we see of other people's lives. Reverend Leslie Takahashi has said that our digital exposure makes us know about others' lives without knowing about their realities. Have you heard that expression that often we are seeing the highlight reels of people's lives on social media? I think rationally, many of us know that, and yet we still compare ourselves and try to live up to that highlight reel, even though we're not actually seeing anyone's reality. It is merely the curated digital life of someone else. The great Reverend Howard Thurman said, the sound of the genuine is flowing through you. Don't be deceived and thrown off by all the noises that are a part, even of your dreams and your ambitions, that you don't hear the sound of the genuine in you. Because that is the only true guide that you will ever have. And if you don't have that, you don't have a thing. He is inviting us to spend time to engage with the internal work necessary to find the voice within us to examine even our own dreams and ambitions because we often get so caught up in the pursuit of a dream that we forget to take stock of whether or not it is actually the right choice. This would be similar to my experience in Washington, D.C. So how do we find the sound of the genuine? 
How do we make the choice to live a life that is defined by that inner voice inside ourselves rather than some external voice that frankly doesn't always know what it's talking about? Ever so helpfully, I'm gonna say, I can't answer that for you. <laughs> but I can say, I fervently believe that you can answer this for yourself. Perhaps the sound of the genuine for you is actually to meet your ambition head on and work extra hours doing a job you love. Or perhaps it is making sure you have time to spend with grandchildren or being a docent at a local museum. I have a friend that I spend a lot of time with engaged in community organizing who said that her job was where she made money, but her true calling and profession was the work we did for free in our community. Perhaps a similar path is calling to you. Or maybe spending time in nature, walking in solitude, or spending half the morning with your hands in the dirt, cultivating something out of nothing is the way the genuine speaks in you. Or maybe you want to live a life more like the otter from the reading earlier this morning, who looks around at his surroundings and finds joy in the simplicity of what he has in this moment, is not concerned by the trappings of our modern lives, but who is grateful for the cool, fresh water of the river he gets to swim in every day. To be sure, getting to decide what to do with your career or how you spend your free time is often a privilege that many people in our world never get to experience, particularly many people of color, people with disabilities, and or those who grew up in lower socioeconomic status. And many of us are not able entirely to decide that we're simply not gonna work, or that we're gonna take a less well-paying job because some outside pursuit may give us more fulfillment. Many of us need to support ourselves and our families, and most of us need health insurance and other benefits, which does often limit our life choices. However, I hope there are ways to spend whatever limited time you have to yourself in a way that gives you meaning, to find even five minutes a day to let the sound of the genuine flow in you. The voice inside us calling to us to find our life's meaning is likely never done. It reminds us constantly and in each season of our lives that it is there and it has something to say. The question is, can we be brave enough not only to listen, but to begin to search for it in the first place? Blessed be. Our next song is Tis a Gift to Be Simple, and I believe this is a shaker song, is that right? Um, in October, I got to go to Hancock, New York, or uh, Massachusetts, yes, <laughs> I'm still learning the geography. Um, and I went to a Shaker village there and it was so wonderful and simplistic and it brought me back to a reminder of how I want to live my life, more in nature, more with more simplicity. So I thought this would be apropos for today. And it's number 16 in your hymnal. Seamus Haney once wrote, the true and durable path into and through experience involves being true to the actual givens of your lives, true to your own solitude, true to your own secret knowledge. Because oddly enough, it is that intimate, 
deeply personal knowledge that links us most vitally and keeps us most reliably connected to one another. As you go forward this week, and as we all welcome the passing into a new month, I hope each of us are able to find time to connect to the sound of the genuine in ourselves or to our own secret knowledge. And I hope we can find a space to share it, whether it be here or in some other loving community. Amen. <laughs>